As they are off of turn number 20, Mark Janes. They are set to go racing here in Austin. Waiting for the green flag, and they're headed toward uh, the final turn. And we'll see the speed start to pick up now as they get to the start finish line. A really good formation off that final turn. And we are just about ready to get this race underway. And we are green flag flies and much like yesterday, they're using every bit of real estate that they can find. They found out about six wide at the back of the field. And Roland didn't look like he got off to a very good start as they head toward turn one, Nick. No, he didn't. Kemper is right where he was yesterday. And we've already got an accident as two or three cars spin to the outside to the right side of the racetrack. It looked like the 29 machine of Spencer Brockman was involved along with a couple other cars. The leaders are now clean through the S. It's going to be interesting to see if this brings out a full course caution, depending on if they can get those cars refired. It looks like the 76 machine of Ryan Hall was also involved. They're all he, back underway. Yeah, he's got that car spun back around. There's Ryan Hall, heavy damage to the left front of that machine. The leaders throw through the S's, Mark. It's Kemper, and then uh, it looked like Roland re-grabbed that second position. Yeah, the 29 car still trying to get itself back underway, and it's having trouble getting going. Plenty of damage on that car to the right front, all down the right side of the rear. Uh, there is another car that is off the course. It's in the runoff area, and here's a look at what happened. Yeah, it looked like Brockman. I don't know if he got turned, but just came flying across the racetrack from driver's left all the way to the right. He hit Hall, and then there is a third car uh, that's involved as well. That's the 33 machine, and boy, that's Alex Pachora, who Mark was involved in that heavy, heavy accident yesterday with Robert Noaker. What a frustrating weekend for the driver from Houston, Texas. Uh, well, we're go it's going to bring out a full course caution because car's not able to get back under speed or anywhere close to under speed on pit road. So uh, a full course caution is out for the second day in a row, an opening lap incident. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, that's the great things about these race cars is these, these drivers can put them just about anywhere out on the racetrack. Uh, but boy, sometimes that happens and I just, I feel for Alex Pachora. I mean, that's two straight days on lap number one. Uh, and in both situations, Mark, he's, he's kind of a victim. Yesterday he had nowhere to go uh, when Robert Noaker's car was, was stopped right in the middle of the racetrack and then certainly got caught up in this one with uh, Ryan Hall spinning across the racetrack. You see heavy front damage uh, to that MX-5. Looks like uh, there's the, the, the 29 machine. Brockman. That is Spencer Brockman as his car is damaged as well. A lot of heavy damage to the right rear and to the right front. So uh, the safety crew is going to have to go out, retrieve those race cars, and and get him off the racetrack. And I guess the 76 machine, yeah, there's Ryan Hall. His car is damaged as well. So uh, a lot of these drivers are going to have to take those machines back to the paddock with some help of some safety crews. Well, Hall flirted with the top 10 yesterday. He finished 12th, and Brockman uh, finished 11th yesterday. So both of those guys had to be all in all pretty happy with their effort uh, and uh, looking to follow that up today. But just uh, they, they aren't going to get the chance uh, to do so. So... Um, uh, Okay, uh, under caution here, waiting to retrieve all three cars involved in that opening lap incident. Celine Roland, Kemper, Stout, Wagner, Carter. That's how they started. We'll see how they align them when we come back. It doesn't matter what you're driving or where you're going. It all starts with battery tender, because if you can't start it, you can't use it. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are under caution. Uh, Kepper is your leader. Grab the top spot. Roland uh, faded a bit at the start, but was able to rebound. He has grabbed the second spot now, and Nick, we're under caution because of a three-car incident. Yeah, and the understanding we have is that race control is reviewing the incident uh, leading up to turn number one, involving the 29 machine of Spencer Brockman, who spun across the racetrack, and the 49 of Peter Enzer, uh, from Finksburg, Maryland, who uh, apparently was a part of the initial contact that triggered that accident. Hard to see when the entire field uh, was coming up to turn number one like a hornet's nest, but uh, that is apparently where the initial contact started between uh, Enzer and the 29 machine of Brockman. So uh, race control is going to review that, and they will uh, either hand down a penalty or they'll, they'll deem it a racing incident. Uh, so, Mo, for those who didn't get the chance to join us yesterday, let's explain the, the, the most noticeable difference this year uh, in uh, 
in the uh, Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup uh, because two separate classes running this year. Yes, that's correct. ND1 and ND2, the two classes. ND1 are for the cars that were built and raced in 2016, uh, 17, and 18. Uh, the fourth generation of the Mazda's MX-5. For 2019, the production MX-5 got an upgrade in the engine. It uh, has about 26 more horsepower, and the engine revs higher by about 750 RPM. So for 19, for this season, we built the cup cars on that newer generation uh, MX-5, the one with the higher horsepower. So that's what we call an ND2 car. From the outside, the way to tell the difference, uh, the windshield banner across the, the top of the windshield, the battery tender windshield banner, on the ND2 cars, the faster class, they're black, and on the ND1 cars, they're red. There's also some subtle differences on the front grille of the car. Uh, there's some, some things that are different, but essentially, look for those windshield banners. The ND2 cars on this racetrack uh, are about two and a half seconds per lap quicker. That's what we saw in, through practice and in yesterday's race. That doesn't mean that the, the guys in ND1 are by any means uh, slouches or anything like that. We have some very talented guys racing ND1, as we saw yesterday. That, that race came down to a yeah, that what was it, one one hundredth of a second yeah. at the end, which is about six inches. Um, John Dean, Nathaniel Sparks, both of the girls in the race, uh, Lonnie Unser and Sarah Montgomery, both in that ND1 class. So there's great racing throughout the field, but yes, there are two separate classes. Yep, and it was great stuff yesterday. And then a, a race within the race for sure. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it couldn't have gotten any closer at the, at the finish line, Nick. No, it was just fantastic. I mean, as you talked about, uh, the, the battle in ND1 was a matter of inches. The battle of ND2 was maybe just a matter of feet uh, because those drivers stayed side by side. Going to get a look at the uh, an incident. Let's watch that blue and yellow car a little bit further back. It's on the inside line. Uh, they're reviewing the incident, and it was, again, Brockman who got spun across the racetrack. Again, I'm making some assumptions here, Mark, but when everyone jumps to that inside line and the first car on that inside line has to check up just to slow those machines down, I think that set off an accordion, and that's uh, why we saw the contact between uh, Peter Enzer and, and uh, the 29 machine of Spencer Brockman that sent him spinning. Yeah, pretty obvious. The 29 had some help. It's just going to be it's up to race control to uh, to determine exactly what the extent of that uh, uh, what the extent of that help was. Let's go to Pit Road and Tony Laporta. So, guys, it's pretty unique down here. I, for one, can't remember an MX-5 Cup race in my three years with the series that's had a weekend kickoff with a pair of opening lap crashes. But these long yellow flags here at Circuit of the Americas have provided some interesting downtime here in the pits. In fact, I'm standing just between the Copeland Motorsports pits at Pit Out and the McCombie McAleer Racing pits. We just saw a crew member from Copeland Motorsports jog on down and talk to uh, Chad McCombie. They're already down here making deals, guys. The, the engineers on the radios for Robert Stout, who's racing for McCombie McAleer, and then the guys from Copeland Motorsports who are on the radio for uh, Brian Ortiz and Michael Carter, they're already down here making deals. And I asked the crew members from Copeland, hey, what's going on? He said, listen, we get the McCombie McAleer cars, Robert Stout, they're hooked up, right? So we're down here trying to make something happen. Let's work together. And then maybe five or six minutes left in the race, we get a good gap, we go racing. I asked the Copeland guys, did Chad agree? He said, yeah, they did. So watch when we go back to racing here. You could see some interesting uh, teamwork between drivers that aren't even on the same team when we get back to green flag racing. Well, to that point, Nick, if you remember yesterday's race, uh, you know, the front two and, and certainly the leader able to check out a little bit because of everything that was going on uh, from positions two through about six. And it wasn't until that last segment of the race, about five or six laps to go, that they finally decided to line up and track the leader down. Yeah, you saw Brian Ortiz and Robert Stout and Michael Carter, those three drivers start to stay single file down the long back straight away and, and uphill front straight away here and they did they started to run down drake kemper kemper started to get a little aggressive uh with with his driving trying to defend and, and continue to turn some quick lap times and and tony while we've got a minute during this caution flag we saw two very emotional drivers uh talking to you yesterday kemper obviously winning the nd2 race and then john dean the nd1 race and you have a little bit more on why those drivers were so choked up after winning yesterday yeah, definitely. It was something that a lot of us in the paddock weren't uh, informed about until we stuck a microphone in Drake Kemper and John Dean the second's face. And as you said, Nick, they both got out of the car. They were really emotional, and they talked about how Six Sideways Racing was down a man. Six Sideways has a lot of drivers here in the pits this weekend at 
Circuit of the Americas, but they are missing one very important member of their team. Philip Kinsey passed away back on March 8th after injuries sustained in a traffic accident right near the uh, team's home shop, which is located right around the corner from the Sebring International Raceway. Uh, Philip was only 27 years old, but he was a very big part of the team. When Drake Kemper spoke, spoke to me uh, about Philip later yesterday after the racing was done, after victory lane was all wrapped up, he was still emotional when he talked about the guy. He said he was just a hardworking, really important member of the family, not the team, but the family at Six Sideways Racing. So John Dean II, uh, Drake Kemper picking up the wins yesterday, but that entire team at Six Sideways racing with very heavy hearts as they remember a very important member of their family Philip Kinsey. Good stuff from Tony LaPorta. Thank you very much uh, for the explanation on that. Uh, we're just about ready to go back uh, racing with uh, Kemper, your leader, Roland Ortiz, Stout, Wagner, and Carter, Lee, Maxson, Oxner, Gonzalez, the top 10. We'll see again if Oxner has the pace that he had yesterday, which allowed him to inch his way into the top five. We expect a different set of circumstances, perhaps, because this restart will be done single file. We'll see if Kemper can get a run. It looks like he and Roland are going to get away a bit early on. Those front two nose to tail. Positions three and four are nose to tail. And now Roland jumps to the high side. They'll go side by side into one. And they fan out all the way across the track. Five wide. Good strong move by Roland. Nick, the question is, by the time they get to turn number three, will Roland grab the spot? It looks like he might. <laughs> Boy, that was an aggressive move. Jumping to the outside and then slicing down across the nose of Drake Kemper. We know Celine Roland's got a fast race car as he's been at the top of the charts and practices all weekend as well as qualifying. Uh, had to charge through the field yesterday. But nice little power move there, Mark, as everyone snakes their way through the yes as Celine Roland takes over the lead. Then we look back at that uh, trio. We saw those guys running third, fourth, and fifth yesterday all day. Brian Ortiz, Robert Stout, and Michael Carter. We know they have good race cars. Interesting, Mark, to already see the heavy hitters at the front of the field. Uh, Celine Roland impressed here a year ago, Mo, and this kid is one of those that has can't miss written all over him, isn't he? Yeah, last year you'll recall he started the second race at the back of the grid and went all the way to the front and won his first uh, race. Celine yesterday, I talked to him after the race yesterday, and he was, he was really quite upset. Not angry that he didn't get the result. He was angry. He was upset with himself for having caused an accident that took out Robert Noaker's car and caused so much damage. So he's out here trying to trying to redeem both himself in his own mind and in in the minds of those drivers around him. He's a class guy and he's a very capable driver. Look at the draft that they get yeah. going down that straightaway leading up to turn number 12. Not enough for Kemper to do anything with Roland just yet, but he is right in the proverbial tire tracks now, along with the rest of the the field, Ortiz, Stout, and Wagner. I, I think he had something for him. I think he realizes, though, we're early in this race. We've still got 32 minutes to go. Just give Celine Roland a little bump draft down the back straight away and stay in line. Also, Mark, want to clean up uh, that lap one incident. The 49 machine of Peter Enzer has been issued a, a drive through penalty for avoidable contact that triggered that three car incident. Yeah, it was pretty obvious that the 29 had uh, some help getting across the racetrack and uh, it collected a total of three cars at all. So that's the call by race control. Celine Roland continues in command now. He's distanced himself a little bit from Kemper and Kemper is under full assault uh, by those cars that uh, were involved in that front five all day yesterday in Ortiz, Stout, Wagner, Carter. They're all right there. Boy, Celine Roland got a little sideways at the exit of uh, turn number 20, and he may get freight trained up the front straightaway here. Kemper's going to take the lead, and it looks like Ortiz and Stout are going to try to charge underneath him. Ortiz is going to clear Roland for second. Stout's right there on the left rear quarter panel looking for third as they snake their way back down the hill. Stout's now got his hands full with Carter, who's up the end. Inside. Yep, uh, the 08 of Carter. You see that car, the, the red car, tries to get to the inside of him now, but uh, Carter can't rest at all. Wagner among those uh, all over him. Luke Oxter, Lee, they're trying to keep pace. Is a, a pretty nice-looking freight train works its way through the S's. Yeah, about an eight-car breakaway early in this event. As Again, it's led by Drake Kemper. Nice to see uh, the, the number five machine of Gresham Wagner, who had some mechanical issues yesterday, get that car back on the racetrack. We know he's awful fast. Start on the front row yesterday, uh, running in that sixth position. And there's that second group that uh, Maxson leads down uh, the back straightaway through turns nine and ten, heading for turn 11. That issue we had, by the way, uh, 
and relegated him all the way to 28th place. So he's certainly looking for a strong finish today. But we talked a little bit about uh, uh, BF Goodrich and their contributions and how these guys are literally able to pound on these tires for the whole 45 minutes of the session. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the good folks at Battery Tender and what they bring to the series. And, and good folks they are. The, the uh, family who own and, and operate Battery Tender have been supporters of this series for several years. Um, and and they're, they're more than just a sponsor. They're very much involved in the series and they, they, they enjoy racing and they enjoy the passion and they enjoy the people the same way that, that uh, the rest of us do. This is, a, this is one big happy family uh, in Battery Tender MX-5 Cup. Aside from that, they, they have a great line of products. They're, they're in the, the charging business, if you want to put it that way, and they sponsor the Hard Charger Award, of course. Um, but for anyone who collects cars or who keeps cars that aren't in daily use, having a Battery Tender uh, charging system uh, keeping your automotive baby uh, healthy uh, is is uh, a must-have and so to the family and the folks at battery tender we appreciate very much they're involved in this involvement in this series um, not just not just from a sponsorship or corporate standpoint but also from their their friendship and, and passion for motorsports i don't think anybody's working any harder right now to fend off attackers than celine Rolotte. Oh, it's incredible i think Rolotte and stout might have even uh, banged doors a couple times around in this last lap New leader, though, is Brian Ortiz has taken over the point. He got around Drake Kemper during that lap. And, uh, yeah, watching Roland and Stout battle for third has been pretty good. As, again, this eight-car breakaway heads up the hill. Stout dives to the inside, had a nice run, and he's going to charge right around last year's Rookie of the Year, Celine Roland. Back down the hill, though, Mark, you can make up a lot of ground as they swoop through the S's. They still run side by side. Stout, Ortiz, they stay side by side. That's Carter taking a peek at what's going on. Roland's able to hold on to third for now through the S's. Not much switch for position here, and I think, Nick, this is that point of the race course where they kind of set themselves up to catch their breath a little bit, and they want to make sure they hit turn 11 right because it's that long back straightaway leading to 12 where you can draft and make a pass. Yeah, the exit of 11 and the exit of 20 are, are the two final corners before you head down long back straightaways, and the way these cars are able to draft and get runs on each other, those are probably the two most imperative corners. We see the field now making their way down towards turn 11. Actually, it looks like Kemper is taking a look to the inside of Brian Ortiz, but this is a really slow left-handed turn, and then they'll start to charge up that back straightaway. <laughs> How wide I, they go. You know, we talk about trying to get a good run. Sometimes they're going to use all the racetrack they can, but here's where that draft really comes into play, Mark, and you see our front two, Kemper tucked right up behind Brian Ortiz. He can pull out and make a move, but as you mentioned, right now at this stage of the race with 27 minutes to go, do you stay patient or do you get aggressive? Uh, Michael Carter gave the wheel a little tug to the left and he felt the rear end slip just a little bit he backed off didn't lose any momentum and he better not because uh, Wagner Oxter Lee they're all right there a pretty good battle now as they work their way through the stadium portion of the course let's hear more about the driver of the 08 young Mr. Carter from Tony Mark you are exactly right when you talk about how much Carter's moving around the racetrack we heard from him this morning I said how did yesterday go it's your first race in the battery tender global MX-5 cup what did you think of it and an interesting interesting note that he made was from hitting all the exit curbing here. Of course, track limits not being enforced by IndyCar race director Kyle Novak. When you run wide so many times here over the course of a 20 turn lap, he said it actually knocked the front end so much out of alignment that in the last couple laps going down the back straightaway, the front of the car was actually floating on him. He said he actually had to fight the steering wheel just to keep the car pointing in the right direction. So all these drivers are suffering from that. But it's an interesting thing to have to deal with when you're a rookie competing in a cutthroat series like the Global MX-5 Cup. Uh, 26 minutes remaining in this event. A little over 26 minutes, in fact. It's Ortiz, Kepper, Roland, Stout, and Carter, your top five. Again, the Oxner goes to sixth. Then Lee, Wagner, Maxson, and Gonzalez. Happy to have with us in the booth uh, this morning. Chris Hill, senior manager for branding, entertainment, and sponsorships uh, for motorsports. That's from Mazda, North America. This is a pretty nice way to spend the morning, isn't it? It's a great way to spend the morning, Mark. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you very much to... Everyone at the IndyCar Classic, uh, IndyCar for having us here. The excitement, the energy here at Circuit of the Americas is uh, it's unbelievable. We're, uh, we're pleased to be part of this event. Uh, races like this, very, very proud. A very proud moment for Mazda, in fact. It is, yes. We, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, everything that these men and women are doing with MX-5 Cup. Uh, you know, at Mazda, we believe in the power of human potential. We build our MX-5s, all of our cars for that matter, 
with the objective of uplifting the driver, the ownership experience, everything that people go through while, uh, while owning a vehicle. Ultimately, so folks can feel enriched, they have uh, energy to pursue their passions, fulfill their potential, and ultimately feel alive. Nowhere is that more apparent in this MX-5 Cup. Yeah, it's just, it's an awesome series. And I think one of the things that impresses me, Chris, quite frankly, is that as Mo Murray and I talked about yesterday, everything, every aspect of, of the scholarship system, the money involved in all of that is all tied uh, with looking toward the future and helping these drivers further their careers. Yeah, it certainly is. And all that credit goes to our director of motorsports, John Doonan, who's done a great job with cultivating, developing drivers, not only through uh, all the sponsorships we've done in the past, but with uh, with MX-5 Cup. These, these folks are, many of them are professionals, have been for quite some time, but we're also looking at developing young drivers, young talent to continue their career. And, and as far as John Doonan, he might be different in like a corporate meeting, a very important set of circumstances. John Doonan's the happiest man on the face of the earth. It's, it's like every day he's at Disney World. Absolutely. How can you not be the happiest guy uh, doing this every single weekend? But uh, as I mentioned before, no one puts in more time and effort. No one supports the brand, believes in the brand more, and really does a great job of, of conveying everything that Mazda stands for and everything that Mazda does through motorsports. Well, I, I know we're familiar with what goes on here in North America in terms of Mazda, but I think Mo and I talked about this over the past couple of years. Staggering to think the number of Mazda-powered cars that are racing somewhere in the world each and every day. That's, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, Mark. Uh, yeah, in North America, there are more Mazda-powered cars road raced on any, any given weekend than any other manufacturer. That's something we're very proud of, something we continue with MX-5 Cup, but also with grassroots racing. We, we have thousands of racers every single weekend um, doing what they love and, uh, and uh, in racing motorsport. And going back to what I said when we first started talking here, folks that are really looking to uh, find something that gives them energy, find something that uh, allows them to continue to reach their potential, whether it's on the track or off the track, and we're proud to just be play a little part in that with, with our vehicles. Uh, Chris Hill from uh, Mazda North America. We'll let you go back to being a fan for a while. How's Thank that? you very okay. much, Mark. Appreciate yeah, the time. Our pleasure. And, and Nick, uh, and, and while while we were visiting with Chris, uh, things not letting up. I mean, they're still hard charging. No, it's still a nice eight-car breakaway at the front, but uh, we saw Drake Kemper jump back to the top spot. Celine Roland now tucked right up behind the rear bumper of that MX-5 as they make their way uh, down towards turn number 11. Then you've got uh, the 08 of Michael Carter, who's moved into the third spot. Brian Ortiz was leading just about a lap ago. He's been shuffled back to the right. fourth position. So uh, it's been an interesting couple of laps. And, and still, Mark, just now about hitting the halfway point of this race. And again, those drivers up front, those eight that break away, Kemper, Roland, Ortiz, Carter, Stout, Oxner, Lee, and Wagner. And uh, let's uh, check in on that ND1 battle. 11th place running Palermo has Dean behind him and then Spark. So those three in the battle oh, and for it the looks ND1. Like, I and think there's our a leader, battle for the lead. Our leader just about got turned there as Carter had a great run. He got into the back of Drake Kemper. Kemper saved that machine down in turn 12. I'm not exactly sure how. That was some tremendous driving. Uh, but Kemper not only saved that car, Mo, he kept it in the lead. That's incredible. <laughs> that was the best save I've seen in some time. Uh, Carter got in a little too hot on the brakes. Very slight tap on the back of Kemper's car, and that car was completely sideways turning in there. And somehow, as you said, he not only saved it, but he kept the lead of the race. Carter, unfortunately, went from second back to sixth, it looks like. Boy, we see <laughs> those eight drivers starting to try to Get back in line as Drake Kemper has to regain himself. Uh, Celine Roland moves up to the second spot, but Mark, here comes Brian Ortiz challenging for that second spot at the inside. Yeah, Ortiz continues to charge. It looks like he's going to dispatch Roland, and uh, Roland's going to try to keep pace, stay right in the tire tracks. The 28 of Stout trying to keep pace as well. Look a little farther back, and we see Luke Oxner again starting to flex some muscle as well, a little bit farther back in the field. We've got a pretty good breakaway of about six or seven cars, Nick, as they head toward turn number one. Yeah, and you get to see right there the, the varying lines that these drivers can use on the front straightaway here at Circuit of the Americas as Drake Kemper swung all the way to drivers right in your head, a couple drivers all the way to the inside of the racetrack. Best battle, though, still seems to be for second as Roland has his hands full with Brian Ortiz and Kemper, a little bit of breathing room. That's about as much breathing room as you're going to get. And we just got word that incident between Kemper and Michael Carter, no action taken. That's Deem Day Racing incident.
it down there in turn 12. Uh, Michael Carter, that scholarship winner in that Mumbo, you said that kid impressed very early on. Oh, when we saw him at the shootout, he he was at the Mazda Club Racer shootout where we select the scholarship winner. He was he was very, very impressive. So much so that, as I mentioned yesterday, some of the other drivers in the shootout uh, said, mm, he's the guy, he's he's the one you should put in this scholarship. And, and certainly he has lived up to that this weekend. He led the race yesterday. Um, he, he made a pass for the lead that ultimately cost him uh, a penalty. Um, but, you know, he's, he's again, very, very impressive. The pride and joy of Savannah, Georgia, and he currently finds himself in the sixth position, but still very much in contention for the win. Drake Kemper, your leader here at Circuit of the Americas. Let's go back to pit lane and Tony Laporta. Speaking of the driver from Savannah, Georgia, he's the scholarship winner. Here's the man who hands out those scholarship checks. John Doonan, your man Chris Hill was just in the booth with Mark and Nick, and Chris described you, or maybe it was Mark, said you're pretty much one of the happiest guys ever at a racetrack, and you're smiling even talking to me. You enjoy Enjoying watching this racing here in Austin, Texas? I'll tell you, I don't know who can't be smiling watching Global MX5 Cup. It's uh, unbelievable racing. I had so many fans at the hotel last night saying that, you know, MX5 race was the best thing I'd seen all weekend. So we're really proud of how these cars race. It starts with long road racing. They build a fantastic car. The parody is amazing. Uh, BF Goodrich puts a good tire underneath us with the support of Pagod and Battery Tender, our title partner. Uh, it's, it's really fun to watch. Big smiles, all, all the fans uh, and everybody down here on pit road. And then can you comment on how the ND2 versus ND1 split is going? It's the first year of seeing this. We've seen dramatic finishes yesterday from the race winners in both ND2 and ND1. You've got to be happy with that. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that the customers that had existing cars did not have to completely transform their car. We gave the chance for those folks to stay with us. But obviously, when Mazda launched the new higher output MX-5, we wanted to immediately in install that in the series. and. You know, a little more power, um, and but the same great racing. So I think when I left race control, we had over 240 passes already uh, throughout the field. Well, $100,000 going to the champion in the ND1 category, $200,000 going to the champion in the ND2 category. So do you think I can get a raise? Well, <laughs> we've used up the, the prize money there, Tony, so you're just going to have to keep trying harder here on Pit Road. That's Director of Motorsports in North America for Mazda Motorsports, John Dune and John, thanks for the time. We're going back to some great racing here on track in Austin. Yeah, with 18 minutes to go, Nick, uh, but we'll, we're going to well exceed 200 passes for this event as well. Yeah, <laughs> and here's why. We look a little bit further back in the field. They got them going two by two by two uh, up the hill through turn number one as we see a handful of drivers uh, battle it out. That's a little bit further back here are your leaders as uh, excuse me now that's still looking back at that battle in mid pack there's your leaders and you know looks like starting to see the front six break away a little bit from Zach Lee and Gresham Wagner who are just kind of holding on for dear life to that lead draft but uh, it is still Celine Roland, our leader, as they make their way down into turn 12. And with all of the work that they had to do, he started dead last. Robert Nowaker of Mo has run a pretty impressive race here today. He sure has. Remember, this kid is 15 years old. He turned 15 on the 31st of January. And starting at the back in a brand new car, they took delivery of this car last night, put his seat in it. Starting at the back of the grade, he's up to P15. And it looks like he's towing his teammate, uh, Brian Lockwood, along with him because he's up to P16 in what would have been No Acres backup car. You know, it's interesting, Nick. I, I, it, it's an old adage. I'm not sure first place is necessarily the place to be uh, with this field over the last five, you know, five to six minutes or so of this I, event. I, I mean, other than leaving turn 20 on the final lap, that's about the only place because uh, it is just so and, easy to get runs on guys and uh, get alongside and, and not just <laughs> not just make passes, but you can run side by side throughout some of the parts of the, uh, the corners, the S's and the rhythm section of this racetrack. That's what impresses me so much, Mo. Well, we yeah. had six different winners last year, but we talked about this yesterday, almost 2,500 passes, but you Whoa. talked about the margin of victory. So oh, across 12 races last year, the combined winning margin was less than five seconds, 4.89 seconds. That's the kind of parity that's in this um, that's in this uh, series. And it's not just the cars, but the, the parity and the diversity among the drivers, uh, the, you know, the diversity for sure, but the level of, of talent among the drivers. We've got veterans, we've got two 14-year-olds, we have a 15-year-old, and, and importantly, we have two women in this race, both in the ND1 class, Sarah Montgomery, uh, and Lonnie Unser, famous last name, mm -hmm. uh, part of the Unser family. Lonnie is, is the 
Aww. as her her grand uncle Bobby called her recently, the newest dancer to come into into racing. She's Johnny's daughter, um, and this is her first weekend in MX5 Cup. She's been doing some spec Miata racing, uh, first weekend here in MX5 Cup, and she's she's performing very respectably. Uh, and Sarah is now in P17. I think she's P4 in the ND1 category. If either one of those girls, Lonnie or Sarah, gets to the podium in ND1, or even the overall podium, they would be the first female driver to reach a podium in global MX-5 Cup history. And that's a, that's a milestone we are, I'm very confident we're going to achieve this year. What is Celine Roulat doing to this field? He's starting to pull away a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened about a half a lap ago is Drake Kemper uh, about got in an incident. He got super sideways. It looked like off of turn number 20, and they went four wide down the front straightaway trying to fan out to get around him. Kemper got kicked all the way back to the sixth position, but with uh, the rest of those drivers like Ortiz and Carter and Stout having to scurry left and right, to avoid a, a possible accident. It has allowed Celine Roland to check out. Uh, he had a one second lead, full one second, which translates on the racetrack mark to about five or six car lengths. Uh, as he now leads the field with 14 and a half minutes to go. So the eight who have checked out, Roland, Ortiz, Carter, Oxner, Stout, Kemper, Lee, and Gresham Wagner. That is the eight car breakaway that you see that has distanced themselves quite a bit from Gonzalez and Max, and then you get back to the NT1 class where Palermo, Dean, and Sparks are running. Now, take a look at the issue that we just uh, talked about. Yeah, and watch that second place running car of Drake Kemper as he gets incredibly sideways here through turn 20 at the exit, as he was right up underneath the rear of Celine Roland's car. Leaned on Robert Stout a little bit, and as they exit the corner, Mark, watch him fan out three or four wide just to avoid the incident. That allowed Celine Roland to get the advantage, and, and that's why he's got a, a nice, healthy lead for now. And I say for now because we've seen it won't be too hard to run him back down. Nick. Nothing wrong with mixing in a little formula drifting off the final <laughs> turn before we hit the straightaway. Nick, you mentioned a moment ago, moment ago that the only time you really want to lead is, is uh, coming out of turn 20 on the yeah. last lap. Recall last year in the first race, <laughs> Celine Roland was in exactly that position yeah. and finished third. Yeah. Right. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot can happen between that last corner and the finish line. Uh, 13 minutes to go. One to give you an idea of the rest of the schedule. Beautiful Barber Motorsports Park, a doubleheader weekend coming up uh, April 6th and 7th. And in June, Road America. They always put on a phenomenal show there. Uh, beautiful Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. That race in Road America, by the way, June 21st and 22nd. Then in late July, Mid-Ohio, then Portland, uh, the weekend of August 31st and September 1st, and then September 21st, Weather Tech Raceway at Laguna Seca. you got to be thrilled to be running with the NTT IndyCar Series. This oh, the, well, there are several things come with us running with the NTT IndyCar Series. One is we're on these big weekends. There's lots of people here. There's, uh, it, there's a big fan base. And for us to put Global MX-5 Cup, Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup in front of all these people is fantastic. The second thing is it allows us to then uh, lean into resources like the production, the TV production crew and yourselves uh, to, to bring this racing to people at home, uh, sitting on their phones or sitting on their laptops all around the country and all over the world. I know we have a big audience in Puerto Rico following uh, Brian Ortiz, who hails from Puerto Rico. Best wishes to everybody on the island. Uh, but most of all, what, what being with IndyCar gives us is the race direction and the race operations that the IndyCar race control gives us. The race director for Battery, Glo Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup is Kyle Novak, the very same race director who handles the NTT IndyCar Series. And that means that the quality of racing, the quality of, uh, of judgment calls, of penalties or non-calls is absolutely world class. It's stellar. Uh, and, and that allows the drivers on the racetrack to go and do what they do without uh, interference, it, it, just like in any in any stick and ball sports, the referees or the race director should be invisible and should be should be not involved in the race, and that's what we strive for. Uh, Nick, while we were talking with Mo, Robert Stout grabs a position. Looks like Carter loses a couple of positions as Luke Oxner in the in the uh, 77 is starting to make a charge. Yep, and Luke Oxner is one of those guys who's just always right there, lingering, ready to pick up some spots if you uh, allow him to, and he is right there in position 
Uh, looking for a podium finish. I'm a little concerned, though, with all the battling that we see doing. Yep. Celine Roland's lead is starting to extend. It was a full second uh, just a couple laps ago, this time by up to 1.9 seconds. So uh, Tony Laporta, our leader, Celine Roland, is comfortable. Second place running Robert Stout. Going to need a little help drafting up to catch him. Well, guys, it's interesting you put it like that, Nick, because if you ask Robert and his father, Ken, a very notable motorsports announcer himself, Robert's got a little bit of help to catch Celine Roland, and it's riding inside that car. Ken Stout, Robert's dad, told me yesterday after race number one that their family also suffered a tragedy in the offseason. Robert's grandfather, Ken's dad, was in an auto accident back in February, and uh, Robert's grandfather passed away. When they went to clean out the grandfather's home, they said that they came across every single piece of PR that ever got put out about Robert in his racing career. Robert's been racing for a very long time, three years here in the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup. So after the uh, services and after everything was handled, uh, Robert's grandfather ended up being cremated. He is riding along inside that number 28 McCombie McAleer racing car. Ken and Robert both very proud to have the grandfather that loved racing so much riding with them here this weekend in Austin, Texas. Uh, Bo, I want to go back to yesterday. The involving uh, Robert Noaker. Uh, I would say the good folks at Long Road Racing uh, had to be uh, an important moment for them, reaffirming uh, their ability to prepare a race car that is very, very safe. Uh, yes, uh, certainly the car that Robert started the race with yesterday took a very significant hit in the left rear corner. Um, unfortunately, Alex Bashura hit him, um, and it took a it took a big hit. That car was was badly damaged. Robert was perfectly fine, stepped out of it. Um, and walked away and was, a, was able to race today. That's a testament to the strength of the roll cage that uh, Long Road Racing puts in. It's an FIA spec roll cage. Uh, the cars are prepared to full FIA standards, so they're, they're eligible to race in, in any sanctioned body all around the world. And that's a good thing. That's why uh, for, for the global nature of Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup, that's a good thing. The second point of note, of course, is that the car that, uh, the display car that Long Road Racing had here uh, basically to encourage more more sales of their car was fully race ready enough so that by eight o'clock last night when they made the decision to pick it up uh, they were able to put a seat in it and go racing today and robert noaker now has that car up into uh, p15 as we mentioned earlier yep so and we just got to see we've got got to look at uh, robert noaker and that silver mx5 and Gosh, Mark, they continue to battle uh, into turn number one. Luke Oxner's looking pretty yeah. hungry. Uh, he's just kind of steadily moved his way up, popped to the outside, trying to get around Robert Stout. Stout's got the run back down the hill. We see Kemper trying to get back up into the top uh, two or three positions where he spent most of today uh, trying to get around Brian Ortiz. But again, Celine Roland's lead continues to grow. It was 1.9 seconds, now up to 3.1 on this previous lap. Yeah, we're, we're turning laps at about 2 minutes and 30 seconds. And uh, uh, honestly, uh, Nick, with the clock winding down to about 8 minutes to go, and those guys probably need to try to get hooked up and stay hooked up, especially uh, between 11 and 12, and then again down the front straightaway. Well, and here's the biggest problem. Celine Roland just went out and set the fastest lap right. of the race, yeah. and he's all by himself at a 231.03. The rest of the field looking at 232s, 231.6, 231.8. .6, so, and we continue to see him getting side by side, exiting turn number 12. They've got to get in line, which they're doing now, to try to run down Celine Roland. That's easier said than done because clearly Roland has Coda figured out. We saw him win a race here last right. year. We saw him charge from the back yesterday. And now that he's got that clean air, he's going to be tough to catch. Yeah, that's a, a, a lead that has grown to 3.1 seconds uh, after uh, the fastest lap. Uh, of, of the race was turned by your leader and uh, Kemper among those continuing to try to make their cars a little wider. Uh, Got to like the run by Luke Oxter today, making a strong bid for a podium. You know, he was not part of that lead pack for most of that race yesterday. Little by little, we started to see him kind of peek in on the top five and actually ended up finishing fifth. Let's go to pit road and Tony Laporta. Yeah, guys, we've got the number 55 of Yuretsky, one of the McCombie McAleer racing cars parked in his pit stall right now. Co-team owner Chad McCombie down underneath the car. They're taking a look at the rear end 
Well, Uretsky described a pretty violent shaking on the radio as the car came into the pits. This is a problem that Robert Stout, another McCombie McAleer racing driver, described after practice number one yesterday. You hit the exit curbing here really violently as you swing wide on the exit of these corners at Circuit of the Americas. It can do some pretty significant damage. Looks like possibly knocking the rear end out of alignment on the back of Uretsky. They've shut the car off now as they continue to work on the 55. So, Stout, Oxner, Ortiz, Kemper, Carter, Wagner, and Lee. Those guys a fan out as they head toward turn number one. And as they do so, Celine oh. Roland set sail with a 3.3 second lead. And Brian Ortiz just about caught the left rear of Drake Kemper's car there into turn number one with the uh, differing lines that you can take. Ortiz really tried to throw it in there. He just about turned Kemper. Kemper's right there in that fourth spot, and he is working over Luke Oxner there through the S's. But there's the lead for Celine Roland. You see him leave the S's right there. Then there's the rest of the pack, Mo. Yeah, Kemper is wearing Oxner out. This is a good show. So remember yesterday, Kemper had a lead of uh, as much as four seconds yesterday, and the guys behind him settled down and gradually reeled him in. But he had that lead with still 20 or 20 plus yeah. minutes left yeah. in the race. We're winding down now with just single digits of minutes left in the race, and and uh, Celine Roland has, has checked out. Really, and as Kemper did yesterday, the reason they were able to catch him, he missed a couple of shifts, and so that's what closed the gap. The the. the the, the rest of these guys following now have to hope that Celine Roland has some kind of an issue or, or or loses concentration and falls off the racetrack or something like that you know, if they're going to catch him. Yeah, there's no rest for the weary and continually defending himself as Luke Oxner, Kemper, wants to go side by side with it. Yeah, look at him drag race down there into turn number 12. Stout's got a nice run. Kemper's going to hang it on the outside. He is fearless. We saw him make some incredible moves yesterday, and he's backing it up today, trying to charge back through the field after an incident in turn 20, dropped him from second to sixth, almost all the way there, back up to the third position as he's trying to run down Robert Stout. Then you've got Oxner there in the fourth position, and uh, in fifth, Brian Ortiz. This is the heavy hitters, Mark, over the last couple years. These are the names that we have seen at the front of the field. That experience, it, it means something here in the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup. Yeah, pretty familiar with those names for sure. We've seen those guys take turns winning. as Six different winners last year in the series, in fact. Uh, and let's uh, now get an update on the 55 to say the day is done, Tony. Yeah, it's a broken right rear shock on the back end of the number 55 from McCombie McAleer Racing for Uretsky. Guys, the exit sausage curbing, as they're referred to, those tall yellow curbs on corner exit here at Circuit of the Americas, 50 millimeters tall, that's 1.9 inches. So in these roadsters, it's not super bad, but you hit them enough times and at the right angle, it can do some pretty significant damage. The 55 of Uretsky out of this race early here in Austin. It looks like the podium is what's going to be decided the yeah. second and third steps because the leader now has a lead of 4.1 seconds. Yep, and that's eight tenths faster than what we saw yesterday. It was, or excuse me, earlier, just one lap. It was 3.3. So uh, we're going to see just two laps to go here at Circuit of the Americas. Celine Roland will see the white flag next time by. And you're right, Mark. It looks like the battle is going to be for second, and it's going to be contested by it looks like at least six drivers, maybe seven, if Zach Lee can hustle his way into that group. Drive through penalty for him yesterday. Mo early on in the race. Roland rebounded to finish seventh. Clearly, he had the proverbial jaw locked coming to the race today. He sure did. And, and you know, at Mazda, we, we love to see people uh, chase their dreams. We say celebrate the win, but live for the journey. And Celine is a very interesting young man. He's, he's still a young man in his early 20s. Uh, worked for the last couple of years at a Mazda dealership, Classic Mazda in Orlando, and did a great job. Was was a highly regarded uh, part of their team there and, and uh, sold a lot of Mazdas. But recently made a decision that, that his dream, aside from racing cars, is he wants to be an airline pilot. And so he, he left his job at the Mazda dealership and is enrolled in flight school uh, to chase his dream uh, of becoming a pilot. 4.1 seconds the lead for Celine Roland, and it's just hard to believe that someone could check out to that extent after how close and competitive yesterday's race was. Yep, it's a testament uh, not only to how good that car is, but to the talent of that driver as he's been awful, awful strong 
Everybody watching that battle for second, though. Robert Stout is holding on for dear life as uh, Drake Kemper has been super aggressive. They may try to go three wide here, Mark, as Luke Oxner uh, kind of shoved it up the inside of Kemper. They get back single file around the stadium portion of the racetrack as uh, we're going to see the white flag here in just moments. Yeah, uh, it, it, Oxner and Kemper for sure finding out that are knowing full well which part of the curbing they can and can't use. They're kicking up dirt, kicking up dust. They're using every piece of real estate at their disposal and Robert Stout is trying to fend off each and every attacker. There's about four or five of them drawing a beat on him as we speak, including, you see, the last card trying to get up and get a podium, the 08 of Carter. Yeah, that, uh, we see the white flag now in hand for Celine Roland, who is your leader in ND2. John Dean is your leader in ND1. Roland crawls back up the hill as this freight train of seven cars continues to give chase. The advantage now, Mark, up to 4.6 seconds. Every lap, it's about a half a second or more he continues to build on this group. And let's go a little further back in that ND1 class, Nick. For the longest time, Palermo was your leader, but now John Dean is looking to sweep that class on the weekend. He has the top position in ND1, currently running 11th. Nathaniel Sparks is 12th, and then Palermo is 13th. Yeah, and the lead looks pretty healthy, Mo, for, for John Dean. It looks like it's a good seven seconds, but uh, uh, what a win this is going to be for Celine Roland. If you can so, Celine, perhaps he's listening in the car about us talking about the, the combined winning margin last year, 4.89 seconds, <laughs> yeah. and he doesn't like that Come stat on, man. because he's going to blow that in this one race. Yeah. For folks watching at home, looking at this car, four seconds, almost five yeah. seconds out in front, thinking, oh, this is pretty good racing. This is not typical uh, Mattery Tender MX-5 Cup racing. Well, this is right here, the battle yeah. for second. Exactly. This is what we've been used to seeing for the lead. Certainly, it's rare for someone to have a day like Celine Roland is having. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's a testament to how well he's got this race figured out. But that battle for second is going to be pretty good, Mark, as they make their way down the back straightaway. Last opportunity to really use the draft other than leaving turn 20. We'll see if Kemper gets aggressive. Looks like he will be. He'll pop to the outside of Stout. Uh, Roland, it just looks like a private test. I mean, uh, my goodness, Stout and Kemper behind him. They're mixing it up. He continues to pull away. Oh. And then Look they go Ortiz. three wide as Brian Ortiz gets aggressive, and they're going to touch, send everybody scattered wide, almost into the runoff area, but when the dust settles, looks like Kemper's going to grab that spot, that 99 car. And here comes Michael Carter in that sole red Mazda. As he goes up the inside of Brian Ortiz, they can use a lot of the racetrack through the S's here. Uh, Gresham Wagner, who's had a really nice day, he's aggressive, trying to take a spot away from Carter, maybe to sneak into the sixth position before this is all said and done. And Carter's way off the racetrack as he has to save it through the gravel and grass. Uh, we're just a couple of turns away. Oxter looks like he's going to try to hold on to that third spot and grab that podium after finishing in the top five yesterday. They're headed for the final turn. How about Celine Roland? Yep, out of turn number 20, Celine Roland scored a win here a year ago, grabbed the Rookie of the Year title, and now as he makes his way up the front straightaway, he will win here at Circuit of the Americas. Celine Roland is your winner in ND2. A little bit further back as they fan out, it looks like Robert Stout might be the driver that holds on for second. Uh, and actually, it looks like Ortiz got up there as Gresham Wagner has got some parts dragging on the racetrack. And we look a little bit further back. Here comes John Dean up the front straightaway, Mark. He will sweep the weekend winning in ND1. So uh, Roland, Kepper, and Oxner, that will be your podium in ND2. And John Dean will sweep the weekend in D1. He'll be joined by Sparks and Palermo on that podium. So a really good weekend for John Dean, a very likable guy who does a lot for a lot of drivers in the paddock. Mode. He sure does. John Dean is one of the stalwarts of this championship. He's been he's been in it for many, many years. He's won as a, as a driver. He's won as a team owner. And now he's, he's on his way to, to uh, dominating the Indy 1 class, at least at this first weekend of 2019. Uh, yeah, and that margin of victory we talked about collectively last year, yeah, obliterated 5.1 <laughs> seconds, the margin of victory <laughs> for Celine Roland. And it, it, it just begs the question, Nick, what might have been if not for the drive through penalty yesterday, considering how hooked up he was today? Uh, I would say that after the first weekend, we've got a clear and defined championship favorite in Celine Roland. I think that's safe to say with how strong he was today. And, and as you said, 
had some points thrown away yesterday with the drive through penalty for the incidental contact, but uh, he's going to be a tough guy to beat throughout the course of this season. This was a very impressive performance, one that, as we mentioned, you don't see in MX-5 very often. Well, think about this. No Waker, uh, you know, with, with, with the car that they uh, prepared for him, started last and ended up finishing 14th. That's, That's a great drive. That is. But, but Roland yesterday had to serve the drive through while the field roared, roared by. Yeah. He came back to finish seventh and, yesterday. And never got a caution. That was yeah. under green through right. the pits and then drove his way through the field. So clearly, Celine Roland, uh, the class of the field this weekend, doesn't end up with two race winning trophies, but uh, ultimately will leave Austin on a high note picking up the win here today. Only 261 passes today. Mo, can <laughs> yeah. we pick that action up a little bit, please? Talk yeah. to the guys in the paddock, will you? Both of the girls in the race had good days with yeah. Sarah in P17 overall and uh, Lonnie in uh, P20 uh, overall, but uh, they are fourth and seventh in the ND1 class. So a great opening weekend for Lonnie uh, Unser and uh, a great welcome back to the series for Sarah Montgomery. She raced in the series for a couple of years and then took a year away uh, and we're very happy to have Sarah back in the series. Uh, it's just interesting Nick uh, you know I, I, of course I give a lot of credit to uh, the guys like uh, uh, Kemper and, uh, and and Carter and Gresham Wagner but boy uh, and a lot of familiar names as you talked about uh, Roman Oxner Stout Ortiz those are guys that, that, that we followed for a while now in the, in the ND2 class and you go back to the ND1 class Dean Sparks Palermo those are familiar names as well yeah ultimately I mean I think we're, we're going to have a great championship Drake Kemper with the first yesterday the second today will leave as your points leader uh, it looks like Roland jumps up into the second position with his wins so uh, you know we've got some pretty clear defined championship contenders we know Luke Oxner is going to be there all season. Robert Stout and Brian Ortiz bring home a pair of top five finishes. Really blown away with how good Michael Carter's done. He is only going to get better. I mean, this is his first race weekend. Uh, but it is Celine Roland who's popping out of that car victorious down there on pit lane. You see him taking the gloves and the helmet off as uh, for the second straight year, Mark. He opens up the weekend with a win in Austin, Texas. And Tony Laporta, uh, you can see our race winner down there. I'm sure he's going to be pretty awful fired up uh, to score the win here in Austin. He's pretty happy. He's got a lot going on. They're slapping the battery tender hat on. Back-to-back -back wins over two years here in Austin, Texas. You like coming to Circuit of the Americas, Celine? I love it. I love it. This track's awesome, and, and it suits my driving style. Um, I think that was sweet redemption from yesterday. We've had the fastest car this whole weekend, and and I proved it there. I, I just kept my head down, and, and that gap just kept getting bigger. It was crazy. How much do you enjoy racing, just flat out racing here in the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup? It's like nothing else you've probably ever driven in. I love it. I love it. Um, I feel like qualifying is actually my weak spot, and, and I usually say that I, I don't really like it. I just can't wait to get to racing, because that's where I know I can shine. Well, you won a scholarship at the beginning of last year to get you into the Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup. With a win here today, you're well on your way to picking up that $200,000 scholarship to continue advancing your career. Congratulations on the win. We'll see you on the top step of the podium. Thank you, sir. That's Celine Roland, your round two winner here in Austin, Texas. Mo, ultimately, final thoughts. Uh, I would thought a really exciting opening weekend here in MX-5. Yeah, uh, Coda, Coda always throws up great racing. I mean, the racetrack is fantastic. Running, as I mentioned, with the NTT IndyCar Series makes gives this the, our series credibility and gives us a great stage to race on. But ultimately, the boys and girls who are in these cars are putting on fantastic racing. As we mentioned, a, a five-second gap at the front is unheard of in this series. Good for Celine. He's the class of the field at the moment. But I don't imagine he's going to enjoy that kind of a, a gap for the rest of the year. These guys are going to figure him out and go chase him down. So, yeah, great couple of races here. And uh, we look forward to our next round in uh, Barber Motorsports Park in two weeks. We will once again live stream those races at uh, Mazdamotorsports.com. And for anyone who wants to go back and look at these two races, they'll be up on Mazda's YouTube channel here in a day or two. Thanks so much. We'll see you in Birmingham. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Mark. All right, that uh, big thank you to uh, to Mo and to Tony Laporta down on pit lane for a great job. For Mark Jaynes, I'm Nick Yeoman. Congratulations to Celine Roland, the winner here in Battery Tender Global MX-5 Cup. We'll see you in two weeks in Birmingham.